Alright everybody, we are back this week for UFC Fight Night Blanchfield versus Furo or UFC Fight Night Atlantic City main event bout in the UFC women's flyweight division between Manon Furo and Aaron Coldblooded Blanchfield. You have the Beast versus Coldblooded in one of the most high level women's fights I believe they could make in the UFC right now with the winner looking to get either a title shot or a number one contender bout, but I wouldn't necessarily think that this is the number one contender bout. And then in the co-main event of the evening, you have a welterweight bout between a former middleweight in Joaquin, New Monsa Buckley, taking on Vicente, the silent assassin Luque, who's coming off that very impressive decision victory over Rafael Dos Anjos. So let's not waste any more time and get into the breakdown for UFC Fight Night Blanchfield versus Furo in Atlantic City. All right, guys, the first fight up is going to be in the bantamweight division between Angel Pacheco, who came off that amazing fight with Danny Puma Silva or Danny El Puma Silva on the Contender Series, taking on Cowan the Don Lochran. Uh, honestly, I do not understand why Lochran's almost a 4-1 to one favorite. You know, taking the odds out of it, if I was going to just watch tape, look at these fighters and, and watch the way that they compete. I would definitely give the power advantage to Lochran. I would give the grappling advantage to Lochran in terms of overall offensive wrestling and top control. But aside from that, I, I feel like this is a pretty close fight. And if we're looking at it in terms of a line, I would make Lochran the favorite, but maybe like minus 150. The fact that Lochran's like a minus 350, minus 375, minus 400, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if you watch tape on these guys, I know that, like I said, the power advantage is going to be on the side of Lochran. Um, He is going to be coming forward, you know, in that low stance, kind of hands out in front of him, popping the jab, looking to land that straight left hand down the middle, you know, and trying to open up for big power shots on the feet, big hooks, big overhands. Um, everything that Lochran throws on the feet is pretty heavy. Um, he does come back with counter check hooks to kind of pivot off and get out of the way. But looking at this from like an overall fighting, like I guess overall game plan, I think that Pacheco's pace, volume, and output is going to be too much for Lochran. This is really going to come down to the fact of can Lochran get in on the hips? Can he take down Pacheco? Can he hold him in positions and land a lot of ground and pound? And can he hurt him? I feel like if there is a fighter who gets hurt early in this fight, it's probably going to be Pacheco because we've seen Pacheco get dropped a lot of times. But the thing is, the guy doesn't quit. Now, maybe against a heavy grappler, it's going to be different because if he gets dropped, it's not going to be as easy to get up on a hip, to shrimp crawl out, to work your way back up to the feet, to use the cage to work your way back up and um, cage wrestle against the guy who's going to be the more seasoned and grappler but overall I think the longer this fight goes it plays into the game of Pacheco more than it does Lochran I think the boxing is a lot cleaner on the side of Pacheco the body work I think is going to be a big big weapon against a shorter stockier fighter like Lochran I think those knees the one two rip left hook to the body uppercuts to the body pop 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 rip 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 mixing up the you know overall output and mixing up the tempo of the combinations I think Pacheco is going to be able to drown Lochran the longer the fight goes. Like I said, if there is an early finish, I would probably side with Lochran. But with Pacheco coming out of the New England cartel, you know, his boxing is very clean. It's very crisp. And just because we haven't seen his grappling inside the UFC does not mean that he's not able to grapple. And I think it's going to be a lot harder for Lochran to get these takedowns and hold top position for long periods of time. Based on the fact that Pacheco is going to be coming in here expecting a guy like Lochran to grapple. Um... I do think he has power to hurt Pacheco, but I don't think he finishes him. And honestly, I, I think the only way that Pacheco loses this fight is if he gets finished or, or gets held down for 15 minutes. And I just don't see Lochran having the ability to do that. I think he will get takedowns. I think he will land some big shots. But I think Pacheco's inside fighting, Pacheco's overall, just his warrior spirit in his heart. And that's not ever something I like to lean on when I'm breaking down these fights technically. But in this fight, I feel like it makes sense because Pacheco fought life and death with Danny Silva. Got hurt multiple times and never quit. And always came back. Got hurt with body shots, worked, found a way to come back. And the guy got contract in the UFC 
off a loss on the Contender Series. So this guy didn't even win on the Contender Series, but he's coming in because Dana White loved his ability to just never give up on himself. And I think the grit, the determination, the volume, the output, the cardio, I think that all goes on the side of the plus 295 underdog at this point in Angel Pacheco. I'm going to go with Pacheco to win via third round TKO. I think he just slows down Lochran and I think he rips those body shots, comes up top and then just drops them with a big shot to the body and gets him out of there in the third round. I don't think... Anybody is going to quit, but if somebody's going to quit in this fight, it is going to be Lochran. I don't see Pacheco giving up or quitting at all unless he gets put out cold, and I don't think Lochran's going to be able to knock him out cold. So I like the underdog here in Pacheco. Give me Angel Pacheco to defeat Kowlin Lochran via third round TKO with a body shot. Up next, we've got a fight in the middleweight division between Andre Petroski taking on Jacob Melhoun. Um, or Malkoon, however you want to say his last name. Petrovsky versus Malkoon is a very volatile matchup. Um, I don't like the durability on either of these guys. I think either of these guys can be dropped. I think either of these guys can be hurt. And we're going to have two grapplers, you know, engaging in a striking contest. I think when you look at, like, on paper, Malhoon has the better striking. Like his jab, his one-two down the middle. Um, he throws good straight punches. I would say the straight punches are a lot better on the side of Malkoon while the looping punches and the power are a lot better on the side of Petrovsky. Um, his hooks, his uppercuts, his overhands, he has good check hooks, um, decent straight punches, but a lot of the shots he throws are, are looping. Like I said, overhands, hooks, uh, and then, you know, a lot of heavy wrestling and looking to set up submissions. Malhoun is going to be the better wrestler, but I find it very difficult seeing a world where he's able to hold down and control a fighter who I believe is going to be much stronger, but is also much more decorated in terms of his overall offensive jujitsu on the mat. I don't really think he's going to be able to hold down and, you know, outpoint a guy like Petrovsky. Now, when you go back and you look at the fight that Malkoon lost, quote unquote, against Cody Brundage, he was on his way to getting a TKO finish, you know, had him on, on the ground in top position and was landing vicious ground and pound elbows hammer fists and caught him in the back of the head Cody Brundage couldn't continue Brundage wins by way of DQ but with Jacob Malkoon other than that I don't think he's going to be strong enough to hold down Petrovsky and I think he's going to get caught in some positions where he's going to leave himself open for subs but a lot of the times when you look at Petrovsky his submissions are kind of from the front headlock position so I think Malhoon might even be a little bit worried in terms of shooting takedowns because you don't want to leave your head there for a guy who's as well versed in the submissions as Petrovsky because they can front headlock, snap you down, go for a Darce, go for an Anaconda, you know, snap down and take your back. I think if Petrovsky's on the top against Malhoon, it's a world of trouble for Malhoon. But I think if Malhoon or Malhoon is on the top in with Petrovsky, I think it's more just worrying about losing top control time and losing the round based off overall offensive position. I think the fighter with better cardio over 15 minutes is Malkoon, but again, the danger factor in this matchup all goes to the side of the plus 170 underdog in Petrovsky. If there's a knockout in this matchup, I think it would come from the side of Petrovsky. If there's a submission in this matchup, I think it comes from the side of Petrovsky. If there's a decision win, um, we've seen... Petrovsky still be able to wrestle and, and, and chain wrestle and grapple even when he's dead tired. Um, I think Malkoon, if he sticks behind that jab early and just keeps popping Petrovsky with the jab and, and stuffs his takedowns, then maybe you could get a late TKO from Malkoon because we know that Petrovsky's cardio isn't the greatest. But again, I, I have this is kind of a toss-up and I'm not super confident in, in the pick at all. But I'm going to go with the underdog in Petrovsky. I, I think he, like I said, he has the power advantage. He's a lot, I wouldn't say cleaner on the feet, but he's more dangerous on the feet with his straight punches, with his hooks, with his overhands. Um, Melhoun has a good jab. He sticks behind a jab well. His one-two down the middle is really good. But again, his chin isn't the greatest. We saw Petrovsky get dropped and TKO'd by Michelle Pereira, but the power, danger, and explosiveness is nowhere, you know, Melhoun's power and explosiveness is nowhere near the level of a Michel Pereira, so I don't really see a TKO coming from the side of Melhoun unless he does it later on in the fight, midpoint of the second round or into the, into the third. And I think if there's a sub in this fight, it comes from Petrovsky, probably from that front headlock, you know, defending a takedown, taking the Anaconda or taking the, jar, the Darce choke. And I think if there's a TKO in this fight late, 
probably Malhoon, but early, the power that Petrovsky has in his boxing combinations, even though it's not the cleanest technique, I think it could be a big problem for Malhoon. So on that level, I have to go with Petrovsky. I'm going to take Andre Petrovsky to get the job done via a, uh, I'm going to go first round sub, you know. I, I, I'm not super convinced it's going to be in the first round, but we've seen Malkoon get finished in the first round by Phil Hawes before. Obviously, that was striking. He caught him on the chin and knocked him out. I think Petrowski could definitely catch him early and knock him out, but I'm going to go with the fact that he hurts him with a big shot, forces Malkoon to panic wrestle, and locks up his neck in the Anaconda Choke. So give me Andre Petrowski, first round Anaconda Choke submission. Next up, a battle in the women's flyweight division between Victoria Dujakova taking on Melissa Gatto. Um, I'm going to keep this pretty short. Uh, I'm not going to go into this fight too much. Uh, Victoria Dujakova, I thought from what I've heard that she was very heavily, you know, a big prospect and a lot of people were really high on her. But then when I watched the tape, I think I was thinking of somebody else and clearly it wasn't Victoria Dujakova. We've seen Dujakova get a finish in the UFC it was off of like a twisting single leg where the opponent went to brace out and broke her arm. I think it was against Estela Nunez. So it was more an injury than a TKO, but it was like that twisting uh, single leg, which was actually pretty cool to see. I've never seen that inside the UFC before. And then the opponent went to brace and broke her arm. Um, other than that, she had went to decision with a couple fighters and her striking on the feet is decent. But I think Melissa Gatto is cleaner in terms of her overall striking. She uses her jab. She can use her one-two. And I also think that she's more dangerous in terms of the grappling on the floor. Um, Victoria Dujakova has had issues with wrestlers, with takedowns, with, with control. We've seen Melissa Gatto get, get multiple submission victories in her career. And when I looked at her striking on the feet, she uses a jab well. She uses a one-two well. She seems to measure her distance well. It's not a lot of looping overhands or anything wild. And I think with Victoria Dujakova, Jakova on the feet. Her striking doesn't look as clean and it's a little bit more wild. So I am going to go with the favorite in Melissa Gatto here. It's not going to be this long drawn out breakdown, but I feel like Gatto's cleaner on the feet and I think she has the grappling uh, to hang with Dujakova and is more dangerous on the mat in terms of her overall offensive jujitsu. So uh, I'm going to take Melissa Gatto. I'm going to go Gatto by decision. I'm not going to go a finish. I feel like a finish in most women's fights is a trap, except for one we're going to talk about later. But I'm going to take Melissa Gatto by decision. I think she's cleaner. I think she's more dangerous. And I think she has more weapons to win. And even if it goes to the floor, she does have submissions to fall back on. So yeah, give me Melissa Gatto by decision. Next up, a battle in the light heavyweight division between a contender series alum in the last Ottoman, Ibo Alassan, taking on the pleasure man, Anton Turkalj, or Turkalaj, or Turkali, however you want to say his name. I've heard people say it like four or five different ways, but when I look at Turkai or Turkalaj versus Alassan, they actually fought before. I'm sure a lot of you guys know that. Uh, fought back on the regional scene and Aslan was just kind of beating his ass, no pun intended, you know, landing big shots, hurting him multiple times, and then later on, when the fight kept going into round two, he got clipped with a shot coming in, somehow Turkal, Turkalaj ended up on the top position and started landing ground and pound and eventually got the win via finish. I don't think we see that again. I think Ebo is going to knock out Anton Turkalaj early, but... Since the line is so close, if you wanted to take the fighter who won the first time out and you got a decent number at like a second or third round finish, I don't think you'd be stupid to do that. I just think Ebo Aslan is going to land those big bombs. He's not a very technical guy. It's a lot of brawling. He's like a brawler style. Big hooks, big overhands, big uppercuts, has good head kicks and body kicks. Everything that this guy throws is with like 100% explosiveness. And taking on Turkalj, who has survived, I mean, he went the distance with Vitor Petrino, even hurt Vitor Petrino in certain points in that fight, so he's not a bum. He just hasn't been able to find a win in the UFC, but I mean, losses to Gilton Almeida and... Uh, Vitor Petrino, I mean, those are two of the biggest prospects in the UFC right now. So, you you, you know, you got to give the devil his due. Um, I think, like I said, Turkalaj can win if he gets Aslan tired and, and slows him down. And then he eventually just beats him up on the feet, gets him to the mat and either ground and pounds or subs him. But early on, Aslan's going to come forward with that heat 
and he's going to try to knock his ass out. Uh, big, big power shots. Everything this guy throws is with power. And I do not think that Anton's going to be able to survive the early storm. I think Aslan's going to get this win back. I think he's going to land a big shot. And I think he's going to hurt Turkalj and he's going to get him out of there. We've seen, we've seen Anton get knocked out by Tyson Pedro. We've seen Anton get hurt by Vitor Petrino and survive. So, you know, Anton can survive. And like I said, later on in the fight, then that is a Anton Turkalj spot. But early, I think it's Ebo Aslan. I'm going to go with Ebo Aslan to get this W back. I think he's going to land big shots on the chin of Anton Turkalj and he's going to knock him out in the first round. Give me Ebo Aslan to win via first round TKO over the Pleasure Man. All right, up next, you've got a battle in the featherweight division between Sarah Longo taking on the New England Cartel with Dennis Bazooka taking on Connor Matthews. Uh, Connor Matthews' nickname is The Controller, so Connor The Controller Matthews. I do not know off the top of my head what Dennis Bazooka's nickname is. I think his nickname is basically his last name in Bazooka. You, you go find me somebody else whose name is Bazooka that competes in combat sports. It's pretty fucking awesome. But uh, Dennis Bazooka taking on Connor Matthews. I think this is a very volatile matchup. I think this is a very close matchup. I think this is a matchup that if we're looking at the betting side of things, you would stay away from. Because I would not favor either side super duper heavily, you know, going into a fight where I'm going to put financial advice out there for. So I think financially you stay away from it. But looking at the fight, um, Bazooka has not had a good career in the UFC. Went back and forth with Sean Woodson, but kind of got pieced up with the jab, the one-twos, you know, the long rangey boxing of Sean Woodson. Did hurt him and clip him at certain points, but got taken down, got out grappled by a guy who's not known for his grappling. And then taking on Jamal Emmers, he comes in and gets sat down with a one-two in the first round and, and gets finished by a guy who's not known as a finisher, but he has showcased power, and we're actually going to talk about Jamal Emmers in a little bit. But not a good look for Dennis Bazooka, but that also means that he's going to come into this fight extra motivated. That means he's going to come into this fight with a chip on his shoulder, and that means that he's probably going to fight very, very hard because this is kind of his last chance. Connor Matthews is a lot more technical, in my opinion. I feel like he uses long-rangey strikes a little bit better. Sticks the jab in the face of his opponent, has good check hooks, um, can use his grappling and wrestling as well. We've seen him get TKOs on the regional scene. We've seen him get submissions, you know, flattening the opponent out and looking to get a rear naked choke. So he is well versed on the feet and he's well versed on the mat. On the contender series, he got the job done in a fight where he was a, a, a decently sized underdog, a little bit less than a two to one dog. And, um, you know, survived the early storm and just kind of walked down his opponent. You know, Dennis Bazooka is good, but I feel like he's really good when he's in the driver's seat. And I think Connor Matthews not only is nicknamed the controller, but I think he's going to be controlling the way that this fight plays out. Because I think he's going to be on the front foot. I think he's going to be able to avoid the big counters of Dennis Bazooka. I think he's going to look to push back Bazooka, get him up against the cage, you know, get him into that over-under position, laying knees to the body, laying knees to the thigh. Uh, I think at range, his boxing is going to be cleaner. I think the power is on the side of Bazooka where if he clips Connor Matthews on the chin and hurts him, he can beat him. Connor Matthews did lose on the contender series to Francis Marshall, but I actually think Francis Marshall is pretty good. I think he's a decent fighter. I think people just look down on him because of that performance against Isaac Dolgarian, but you know, I still think Dolgarian got robbed in that Christian Rodriguez fight, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, Matthews got beat up. He, he got finished, but in his contender series fight the second time around, he got hurt, he got clipped, but then he came back, he hurt his opponent, he rocked his opponent, he out-wrestled his opponent, he find, you know, controlled from the top position, got takedowns, and he's a very well-rounded fighter. He uses his jab well, the counter check hook, the one-two down the middle, um, can use his kicks pretty well. I think he's cleaner than Dennis Bazooka on the feet. I think Bazooka is the more explosive and dangerous fighter. I think the fighter whose game plan is probably going to suit well over a 15 minute fight is Connor Matthews more than it would be Dennis Bazooka. Um, I think if Bazooka wins this fight, it's probably done via finish, but fighting out of the Sarah Longo team, I think he might rely a little bit too much on his wrestling in this matchup, uh, wanting to showcase good cage wrestling, getting takedowns, you know, cage pressing. And I think that kind of plays into the game of Connor Matthews as well, because I feel like Matthews has the better jujitsu, probably has the better top control. And in a wrestler wrestling exchanges, I think that Matthews probably gets the better of the exchanges that the longer the fight plays out or gets the better of the exchanges the longer that the fight plays out in terms of the grappling scenarios. 
Um, I like Matthews a lot in this this spot. I wouldn't bet it. Um, he is an underdog, but I, like I said, I wouldn't advocate throwing your money on either side of this fight because I think it is a very volatile matchup. Um, I'll go 55-45. I'll favor the controller because I think, no pun intended, he's going to be able to control where most of this fight takes place. I think he's cleaner on the feet. I think he has more output on the feet. I think as long as he avoids the power of Dennis Bazooka, um, I think he can use takedowns. I think he can control Bazooka on the mat. And um, I think he gets a late finish. I'm going to go with a late submission for Connor Matthews. I'm going to go with a third round uh, rear naked choke. I think that he controls it on the feet, but then starts getting that wrestling off. It starts to tire out Bazooka. Um, and then he gets flattened out, lands some hammer fists or, or hooks as he flattens him out and then sinks in that rear naked choke. So give me the controller. Give me Connor Matthews third round rear naked choke over Dennis Bazooka. Up next, you've got a battle in the featherweight division between Julio Arce taking on Herbert Burns. I think this fight is going to go one of two ways. Either Herbert Burns bum rushes and finishes Julio Arce in the first round, or he tires out, he gasses out, and Julio Arce knocks him out in the second or third round. I think Julio Arce is the much better fighter on the feet. I think the better grappler is Herbert Burns, and that's probably what he's going to look for. He's going to look to front headlock, snap down, submit Julio Arce and pretty much just get him to the mat. Herbert Burns wins this fight if it is a full-on grappling match, but Arce's no slouch on the ground either. He can throw up triangles, he can throw up arm bars, he can look for leg locks, and he's no fish out of water on his back. So even if Burns gets takedowns, I don't think he's going to be able to submit a guy like Julio Arce because he's not completely incompetent when it hits the mat, but he likes to keep it on the feet. He is a boxer. He's a southpaw boxer, you know, check right hook, Straight left hand down the middle, big left head kick. I mean, he uses that head kick extremely well. He's got very good lateral movement. He stays on the outside, uses that lead hand, jab, check hook, straight left hand, left hand, left head kick, one, two, circle out, move left and right. Um, Herbert Burns is, is a fish out of water on the feet. Unless he lands a big shot like he did against Nate Landor with that big knee in the clinch, uh, lands a big shot on Arce's chin and knocks him out. Arce's like a four to one favorite. I think it's justified. It's just, can he get out of that first round and survive? If he survives the first round, I think Arce's chances of winning go from like a 60% to a 75 or 80%. Um, actually, I'll go 80 to 85% if he gets out of the first round because I think second round and third round, it's all Julio Arce, and I don't even think we get to the third round, but I think Julio Arce gets a finish here. He's a lot cleaner. He's the much better boxer. He's much more comfortable on the feet. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say he has a power advantage, but he 100% has a technical advantage in terms of the striking, both the boxing and the kickboxing. Yes, Arce did get knocked out, but it was by Song Yedong, who just fought Piotr Jan and, you know, pieced him up in the first round of their fight at UFC 298. So, uh, or 299, I'm sorry. Julio Arce is going to, like I said, have to, to weather the storm. But once he weather, weathers the storm, I think he drowns Herbert Burns. I think we get a second round TKO finish from Arce. I think he gets taken down. He survives the chokes. He survives the submission attempts. Burns starts to tire out. He gets a little bit too uncomfortable on the feet, telegraphs his shots. I think the knees, the left hands, the one-twos down the middle, the left head kicks are coming through, uh, the check right hook. I think Arce actually drops Herbert Burns with a big left head kick in that southpaw stance, jumps on him and gets him out of there with a TKO in round two. I'm going to go with Julio Arce via second round TKO, dropping him with a head kick and jumping on him for some ground and pound. I, I love Arce in this spot. I think Arce is much cleaner. He's much more technical and he's much more dangerous on the feet uh, in terms of an overall striking matchup. As long as he can survive the early grappling exchanges, survive the early barrage from Herbert Burns, just like Bill Elgio did. Um, I think he definitely wins this fight. So give me Julio Arce to weather the storm and get the job done via a second round TKO. Uh, if I'm looking at betting it, I would like the KO-TKO round combos on FanDuel and I would take Arce by KO-TKO in round two and round three. If it's at like plus 400 or higher, take that all day. So I like Arce second round TKO, betting window, betting you know options. I would take Arce second or third round TKO on FanDuel, but the pick is Julio Arce, second round head kick into ground and pound TKO. Up next, you've got a battle in the women's strawweight division between Verna Jandri Roba taking on Lupi Godinez. I think, I think Lupi versus Verna is a pretty good fight. I think it's going to be close, and I think the fighter with the 
Jiu-Jitsu advantage is Verna Jandri Roba, but I would say the wrestling advantage might go to Lupi Godinez. If you go back and you watch the Tabitha Ricci fight with Lupi, um, I bet Tabitha Ricci in that spot is an underdog. I thought Tabitha Ricci did enough to win that fight. Going back and re-watching it, I wasn't so sure. I thought maybe that, you know, maybe it was the bias kicking in the first time I watched it, but I definitely think Lupi did enough to win that. You know, except getting dropped at the end of the round. She would get dropped and hurt at the end of the rounds. And I think that's something you have to think about when looking at this fight with Jandri Roba. Um, I think the more powerful striker is Verna, but the much cleaner striker on the feet is Lupi. And the much faster fighter on the feet is Lupi Godinez. Verna Jandri Roba does have a lot of power, but it's a lot of looping hooks, big overhands. Uh, you know, kind of overextending on all of her punches, but she really wants to get the fight to the mat. She's going to have the better jiu-jitsu. She's going to have the better top control, but I don't necessarily think she has the wrestling to get Lupi Godinez down, even if she does get those, you know, go into those wrestling exchanges. I don't think Lupi Godinez is going to be able to, or I'm sorry, I don't think Verna Jandriroba is going to have the wrestling to get it to the mat. And even if she does, I think that Lupi can pop her way back up to the feet. I would not be surprised if Verna won this fight, but I think the slicker fighter, the more well-rounded and the more skilled fighter is Lupi Godinez. I think she's faster. Her boxing is very crisp. She trains with Irene Aldana. She trains with Alexa Grasso. Her 1-2 is very clean. The 1-2 left hook is real clean. The jab left hook right hand. The 1-3-2, the 3-2, the 1-2-3. All the simple, you know, staple boxing combinations. Lupi Godinez has those in spades. She keeps her hands right on the eyebrows, just like Irene Aldana, just like Alexa Grasso. She waits for the opponent to come in. Bang, she lands counters. Bang, 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 bang. I think her cleaner, crisper boxing is going to be able to catch... Verna Jandiroba inside the looping shots. I think she's going to be able to catch her stepping in, be able to land those big counters, counter left hook as uh, Verna closes the distance, counter uppercut. But again, you have to look at it like this. I think Marina Rodriguez is a much better striker than Lupi Godinez, but she's nowhere near the grappler of Lupi Godinez. So just because Verna Jandiroba beat Marina Rodriguez, she knew she was going to have a massive advantage if the fight hit the mat. Lupi Godinez is a decent striker. I think she's a cleaner striker than Verna, not as clean and technical or talented as Marina Rodriguez, but she's a decent wrestler. She has good submissions. She can go into grappling exchanges and she's nowhere. She's not a fish out of water, even if Verna gets those takedowns. So it's going to be a lot harder for Verna to control and, and you know, potentially submit Lupi Godinez than it was for her to use that grappling game plan as an avenue to beat a high level striker like Marina Rodriguez. So it's a different style of matchup against a more well-rounded fighter in Lupi Godinez. I think Godinez can hang on the feet. I think her counter boxing is going to land on the chin of Verna Jandri Roba. And I think even if Jandri Roba gets the takedowns, even if she gets her to the mat, I think Lupi can scramble. I think Lupi can work her way back up to the feet. I think Lupi can threaten with submissions. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless it's the later rounds when she starts to slow down Jandri Roba. But I think Godinez is cleaner on the feet. She's faster on the feet. She doesn't telegraph her shots and she can hang in the grappling exchanges with a fighter who's going to look to get those takedowns and get that top control time. I don't think Verna's going to be able to hold down Godinez. And if that's the case, I think Godinez is going to be able to out volume her, out land her on the feet, land the heavier shots and potentially slow down Verna Jandri Roba and get those takedowns and grappling on her own accord the later the fight goes. So I like Lupi Godinez to win this fight uh, via decision. She is the favorite going into this matchup, but I think she's the much better fighter. I think she's more skilled. I think she's more well-rounded, and I think she has better cardio, and she definitely has the better boxing in terms of less telegraph and sharper shots. So give me Lupi Godinez to defeat Verna Jandri Roba via a 29-28 unanimous decision. Next up to close out the prelims, we have Nate the Train Landor taking on Jamal Pretty Boy Emmers in the featherweight division. Um, I'm going to be the first to say it. I've never been a big fan of Nate Landor, and I feel like I've faded him in almost all of his fights in the UFC. I picked Dan Ige to beat him by knockout, and I mean, he should have got that knockout like three times in that fight and just didn't get the finish but won a clear decision, but did slow down later in the fight. Um... I believe I picked Julian Arosa against Nate Landwer. He landed that flying knee in the first round, knocked him out. I picked Austin Lingo in the fight with uh, Nate Landwer, and he lost, got submitted in that matchup. 
Um, in this fight, I think Jamal Emmers is just going to be able to use his reach and use his range a lot better than Landor. Landor does the best when he's able to kind of control the pace, when he slows down the opponent, when he overwhelms them. And I feel like if Jamal Emmers was able to compete with Jack Jenkins on the feet, and a lot of people thought he got robbed. I thought Jenkins won that decision, but a lot of people thought that he got robbed in that fight. I think Embers is going to have the much heavier power. His shots are going to have a much bigger effect on Landor than Landor's are going to have on Embers. Um, but Landor is durable. He is able to survive big shots, but he gets hurt. He gets dropped. He gets rocked in a lot of his fights. I think Embers 1-2 down the middle. Um, the low kicks, you know, front kicks to the body, teep kicks to the knee. He's going to want to use his length and reach to kind of pick apart Nate Landor as he tries to close the distance. And I think he has the wrestling to hang with Landor where it's not going to be easy for Landor to get the takedowns, change levels, and control Embers on the mat. I think if he gets those takedowns, then Landor is going to have the better game in terms of top game with, you know, working from half guard, working from side control, working from the full mount. And he is live to set up that submission because we have seen Embers get submitted, but it was against one of the highest level grapplers in the UFC in Pat Sabatini. I don't think Landor has that level of grappling, but I do think if he slows down Embers that the grappling and top control can be a problem in the midpoint of the second to the third round. Um, but I think Embers is the clear side in this fight. I think his jab is 1-2 down the middle. The pop he has on his shots, the long rangey combinations, the inside and outside low kicks. I think Embers is kind of coming into his own. He was able to survive the striking and the grappling against Hussein Askabov, who was, you know, 25-0 and 0 coming into the UFC, but kind of got fraud checked, um, you know, was very competitive against Jack Jenkins, who was a very high-level striker, and uh, obviously just knocked out Dennis Bazooka in the first round with that one-two. So I think Emmer's, I think it's Jamal Emmer's time. I think it's the time of the pretty boy. I think the combinations, the long rangey shots, the power on the feet, um, the distance striking and range management is going to be too much for a fighter like Landor, who yes, has decent striking, but he likes to walk forward. He likes to pressure. And I don't think he's going to be able to break a guy like Emmer's over 15 minutes. If Landor wins, it's in the later rounds. But I think Jamal Emmer's uses that jab, uses the one-twos, you know, front kicks to the body and low kicks to kind of keep Landor at a distance and crack him with big shots as he steps into range. So I'm going to take Jamal Emmers to win this fight via 29-28 unanimous decision. Um, Landor's tough. He's durable. He has been finished before. Um, I could see Emmers cracking him with a big shot and knocking him out. Nate Landor got finished by Herbert Burns as well with a big knee inside the clinch because he just kind of you know, relies on his forward pressure and his dog mentality. And I don't think that's a good thing in this fight. So I don't think he gets finished, but I'm going to take Jamal Emmer's 29-28 unanimous decision against Nate Landor. I think he's too crisp, too clean, and too technical for a fighter like Nate to train. Up next, we've got a battle in the welterweight division between Chidi, Chidi Bang Bang, and Jokowani taking on Reese McGee. Honestly, looking at this fight on paper, Chidi and Jokowani should murder Reese McGee. I mean, he should walk forward. Land that one too, like he did on Mark Andre Berriot, and knock him out in the first round. But the one thing we know about Chidi Njikwani is, for as clean, as technical, as crisp as he is in terms of his striking, I mean, it's clean. Knees to the body, can throw head kicks from close range, good one twos, lands elbows, knees in the clinch. But the thing is, if he can't get you out of there early, he's gonna gas, he's gonna wither, and he's gonna break. And that's the question: Can he get Reese McGee out of there early? Or is he going to slow down and wither and kind of just give up on himself and quit? I'm not calling Chitty a quitter, but in this style of matchup, I think I have to go with the more... I wouldn't necessarily say the more durable fighter, but the fighter who's going to stay in the fight. And I think that's Reese McGee. Chitty and Chikawani should win. He should. He's cleaner. He's crisper. He has more power. He has the higher knockout upside. 100% the better kickboxing. But if he doesn't get McGee out of there in round one, he's going to break. He's going to break. We've seen it before. He broke in the first round against Mihal Oleksiejczyk after he beat the living shit out of him. Couldn't get him out of there. And then Oleksiejczyk just walked forward, bullied him, and got him out of there in the same round. It didn't even take an extra round. It was the same round that he beat his ass. He broke. And I've picked Chidi so many times and he's kind of stabbed me in the back. So I'm going to go against him here. I'm going to go with the underdog and Reese McGee, Skeletor Reese McGee or Reese Skeletor McGee. Not because I think he's the better fighter, but because I think he has more heart. I think he has more durability. We talked about that earlier on the breakdown. I think he's going to be able 
to survive. He's going to get pieced up. He's going to get bloodied. He's going to get hurt. But I think he survives into round two. I think he walks forward, lands body shots, lands knees in the clinch, lands elbows, drops Chidi Njikawani and gets a second round TKO in this fight. Chidi should win. But in this matchup, I'm going to go with Reese McGee to get the finish in round two. I, I think he survives. I think he gets his ass beat in the first round, but survives, doesn't quit, doesn't go out. Chidi gets tired and Chidi quits on himself. Could be at the end of the first round. I'm going to go early second round TKO finish for Reese McGee. Closing that distance as Chidi's backing up, huffing, you know, huffing smoke. Body shots, left hooks to the body, right hooks, knees, elbows in the clinch. And I think he gets him out of there. So give me Skeletor, Reese McGee to defeat Chidi Njikawani as the underdog via a second round TKO. I just don't like siding with Chidi based on the fact that I've seen him quit. And not only quit, but quit in the, first, the same round that he was destroying his opponent. So... Um, I'm going to go with the fighter who I think lasts longer and the fighter who I think is going to be more durable the longer the fight goes. Give me Reese McGee, second round TKO over Chidi Njikawani. Next up, we've got a battle in the UFC's featherweight division between Bill El Senor Perfecto, LGO taking on Kyle the Monster Nelson. Um, this is a fight that I think is, is tailor-made to go to a decision. I'll start it off here. I think this fight goes all 15 minutes. And I think that makes this a very difficult fight to bet on. I think the more well-rounded fighter is Bill Elgio. I think he has higher output than Kyle Nelson. I think he mixes up things better than Kyle Nelson. Um, just his ability to stance change and throw his combinations is going to be a problem. But the one thing I don't like going up against a fighter with the style of Nelson is Nelson loves the outside low kick and he loves the lead body kick. He'll chain them together. He'll go lead body kick. Then when he puts that foot down as you walk forward, if you're in the same stance as him, which is an orthodox stance, he'll throw that outside low kick. Going against a fighter in Elgio who has a side stance, he kind of has like a Wonder Boy, like a poor man's Wonder Boy stance. Side stance, kind of in and out. That leaves your calf and your leg right there to be kicked. There, there's no way to brace for it. There's no way. You have to turn and check. You can't just check. You have to turn your foot, turn it like extra, and then check it. With Nelson being the same stance, I think those right low kicks are going to be there all day. I think the jab, the right low kick, um, the 1-2, I think cross lead body kick are going to be there. But I think the more dangerous fighter and the fighter with more output throughout the 15 minutes is going to be LGO. But how bad are those low kicks going to hurt him? I really think it comes down to the stance of LGO what is what makes this fight so close. Like those low kicks against that side on stance are going to be a big problem. And he's going to be throwing those low kicks. But I think the overall better fighter is Bill Elgio. I think the fighter who probably resorts to the wrestling in this fight, if it goes there, would be Elgio. But Elgio doesn't have the best takedown defense. And off of his back, you know, it's he's not great. But he does have decent, you know, grappling. He did get a submission against TJ Brown after kind of getting pieced up by him on the feet. And, uh, you know, slowed him down, hurt him, and then choked him out. So we know that he has offensive jujitsu as well. Um... I think this fight's going to be really close. I think this fight goes to a decision. I don't think there's a finish. I think if there's a finish, it's probably Elgio. Maybe land in one of those big knees. Land in that lead body kick. Um, or I'm sorry, land in one of those big knees. Land in an uppercut. Land in like a spinning hook kick on Nelson that he doesn't see. Um, I think if there is a finish, it comes from Elgio. But I think this fight goes the distance. And I think the way that these guys fight, I think it's just tailor-made to be a close fight that probably ends by a split decision. Um, I don't really know which side I want to pick here because I've picked against Kyle Nelson in his last two fights and he's won both of those fights. Once against Builder and once in his last fight against Padilla. Um, the Padilla fight was way closer. I feel like he didn't really win that fight, but I mean, he won the fight, but I don't really know if he won. It was close, but he definitely won the Blake Builder fight. Um, Big underdog in both those fights as well. Coming in as an underdog again. Sizable underdog, but not as big as the last time. Um, oh man, I don't know. Because I feel like I feel like I want to pick against Kyle Nelson. But he just fights so close with everybody. And he never really gets dominated anywhere. Elgio with that side on stance is open to those low kicks. Open to those body kicks. Um, I picked against Elgio in his last fight. Or second to last fight. And he came back and he won. I picked him by finish against... Alexander Hernandez and he lost the fight or he won the fight but didn't get a finish 
I'll go LGO. I'll go LGO. Uh, I'm going to stick with what I thought because I feel like my reads are right on Kyle Nelson. It's just he fights so close. I'm going to go Bill LGO by a split decision. I think this fight does go all 15, um, but I think the bigger, more impactful shots come from Bill LGO. I think the fighter who's going to be cut up and bruised and hurt more in this fight, showing more damage, is going to be Kyle Nelson. And uh, I think you just got to worry about those low kicks with that side on stance. The lead body kick and the low kick are going to be the biggest weapons for Nelson. And then the one twos down the middle. Um, he is clean. He is crisp. He is technical. I would not bet on this fight. I would keep your money as far away from it as you want or as far away from it as you can. But I'm going to go with LGO. I'm going to go with LGO by split decision. I think that he has more weapons. I think he lands the bigger shots, and I think he has the judges kind of believing that he's winning more than he might actually be. So give me Bell LGO by split decision, 29-28. Up next, you got a battle in the middleweight division between Nursultan Ruzi Boev taking on Cedriquez, Cedricus, the Reaper Dumas, SD Dumas. 9-1 for Dumas to 35-8. Yeah, 35-8, 2-2 for Ruzi Boev. Um, I see a lot of people on the Dumas side as a big underdog. And I just don't see it. I saw the value in him as a dog against Cody Brundage. I think he was like plus 200 there. Ended up getting that pick right. But that's Cody Brundage. He's very hit or miss. He either looks really good or he looks really bad. Um, Nurseltin Ruzi Boev is going to have a big grappling and wrestling advantage in this fight. On the feet, I don't love his striking. I know he caught the kick and threw the right hand and then knocked out Bruno Ferreira. I'm not saying it was a fluke, but I feel like the longer that fight goes, I think Ferreira probably finds a way to chin him. And um, I don't necessarily love the love that Ruzi Boev is getting, but I think he's going to have a huge wrestling advantage, a huge grappling advantage. And we did see Dumas be able to out-wrestle and out-grapple and out-position uh, Cody Brundage the longer that the fight went, wind up in top position and land ground and pound. But um, I, I, this is a different style of fight. I mean, Ruzi Boev got put in a Kimura on the regional scene, reversed the position and ended up putting his opponent in a Kimura and then swept him to the top position um, he's got arm bars off of his back. He goes for triangles. An opponent put him in a triangle choke on his back. Um, off of the opponent's back, I guess you could say. And then he picked him up, slammed him, and knocked him out. He's got big head kick knockouts. Um, decent striking. I think Dumas has a little bit of advantage in the striking. But he doesn't have really high output. If you watch the fight against Abu Azaitar, uh, he wasn't really throwing anything. I feel like Azaitar could have won that fight by split decision. Except he gave up some takedowns in top position, which probably is what led to those. And then, you know, Dumas landed a big head kick at the end of one of the rounds. But he didn't really have a bunch of output. He was kind of throwing like one strike at a time and was standing in the mirror for a lot of the fight. I think that if he does that here against Ruzi Boev, he's going to get hit with the bigger shots. I think he gets taken down. I think he gets controlled. Um, I don't understand a lot of the love on the side of the underdog and Dumas here. I could understand it in some fights like against Brundage. I could even understand it a little bit against uh, Abu Azaitar, even though he was the favorite. But I think Nursultan Ruzi Boev has Dumas covered everywhere. Unless Dumas lands a big head kick on the feet, lands a big one too. Because like I said, Ruzi Boev's defense on the feet is not the best. He kind of backs up with his head in the air and he looks a little bit wide-eyed when shots are coming at him. Like he's kind of like a little bit fidgety. So I could see Dumas landing a big shot and hurting him because Dumas does possess power in his kickboxing. And he is a pretty technical striker. But I really think this fight comes down to the grappling, and I think Ruzi Boev does get those takedowns. I think he does get that top position, and I think he eventually submits Dumas because we've seen Dumas get submitted by Josh Fremd, where he just got taken down and submitted. Now his grappling has gotten a lot better, showcased in the Brundage and the uh, Abu Azaitar fight. His grappling has gotten much, much better, but I still think Ruzi Boev, I mean, he's got... 40, let's see, 44, 45, 40, 47 fights compared to 10 pro fights for Dumas. Um, you can't necessarily take experience all the time, but I think you can take experience here. I think the grappling is going to be too much. I think Dumas is live on the feet because, like I said, I don't like the way Nurseltin moves around. I don't necessarily love the way he pulls away from shots and, and moves backwards. So there is a chance that Dumas catches him, clips him, and hurts him. But I think Ruzi Boev gets those takedowns, gets the top control, Slides over into the mount, lands big ground and pound, takes the back and gets a rear naked choke submission. I'm going Nursultan Ruzi Boev to defeat Cedriquez Dumas, SD Dumas, via a second round rear naked choke submission. I think the grappling and the submission upside is just a lot higher. And along with the experience, you know, you have to take experience into consideration. But on the feet, like I said, Dumas is live. But I like Ruzi Boev to showcase his grappling, showcase his wrestling. Get to the top position and take the neck of SD Dumas. Give me Nurseltin Ruzi Boev 
by second round rear naked choke submission. Up next, we go to the featured bout of the evening in the middleweight division with the return of the former middleweight champion and Chris, the All-American Weidman, taking on Bruno Blindado Silva. Uh, Weidman coming back after the... I mean, I guess after the loss to Brad Tavares, you know, just getting pieced up with those low kicks, but, you know, Weidman never quit. He should have gotten TKO'd multiple times in that fight, and he still stayed on his feet. He still pushed forward. He still looked for takedowns, still looked for wrestling. Um, I think this fight is a lot closer than the line, but I also think Weidman's a lot older. You know, he's gotten, I think he's lost like six out of his last seven or something crazy like that. So you can't really be heavy on the side of Chris Weidman. Um, Bruno Silva is going to be the much more powerful striker. Um, he's going to be coming forward. He has decent takedown defense. He went life and death with Alex Pereira, but then he got knocked out, uh, basically knocked out and then submitted by Brendan Allen, got dropped by, you know, Gerald Mearshar, which is not a good look, and then got submitted. Um, I think Chris Weidman is live here. I don't love necessarily picking Chris Weidman because he looks a lot older, a lot slower, but he's going to have the wrestling advantage. Silva has really good takedown defense, but he's going to have the reach advantage. He's going to have the wrestling advantage. Um, it's just going to be the speed of Bruno Silva, but I don't think Bruno Silva is that fast. I think people kind of overestimate the speed that he has. And I think if the fight hits the mat, if Silva's on top, Weidman's in trouble. You know, from inside his guard, he can land big elbows, hammer fists, knock you out. Um, it, it's, it's not a good look. On the feet, I think Bruno Silva can clearly knock out Weidman, but I don't necessarily think that Silva is going to be able to deal with the wrestling of Weidman in this spot. Now, I feel like this is a fight where you could easily pick Bruno Silva because Weidman's been gone for so long, because Weidman hasn't looked good in his last few fights. But honestly, I think Weidman is the spot, is the side here. I think Weidman is the side. I, I don't, I'm not saying it's a smart pick. I'm not saying it's the greatest pick. But when you really look at it, Silva is kind of chinny. Silva can get out grappled. Silva can get taken down, he can get put in bad positions, and the best wrestler that Silva's ever fought is Chris Weidman. Yes, Weidman's older, yes, Weidman doesn't have a great chin, but I feel like he can survive the big looping punches of Bruno Silva, but, you know, he could clip him with a big shot and knock him out, but if Silva comes forward reckless, I think Weidman can catch him with a check left hook, I think Weidman can catch him with that one too, I think Weidman is gonna be the much higher level wrestler, I think he will get those takedowns. And I'm going to go Weidman by submission here. I think Weidman is going to be able to take down Silva. I think he's going to be able to get them out. I think he's going to have much higher level jiu-jitsu than Silva. I think he gets to that top position. And I think he locks up an uh, arm triangle choke from the mount. And I think he submits Bruno Silva. I didn't like the fact that Silva got knocked out. Well, dropped and then submitted by GM3. I didn't like the fact that he got dropped and then submitted by Brendan Allen because even though Brendan Allen is moving up in his career and he's looking better and better, I don't love that look getting dropped by Allen when Allen doesn't really drop anybody. Um, I think Silva's live for a round one knockout. I think Weidman is live for a round one knockout or a submission as well. Um, you just have to worry about what Weidman's going to look like. He is going to be slower, but I don't think Silva's that fast in terms of his combinations. And I think people give Bruno Silva a little bit too much love because of the fact that he went di the distance with Alex Pereira. But I think the wrestling, the takedowns, I think he's going to be able to out-wrestle Bruno Silva here. I'm going Chris Weidman. I'm going the All-American. I'm going Chris Weidman by a second round arm triangle choke submission. I think he gets to that top position, ground and pounds, and then takes that arm triangle choke from the mount. Give me the returning All-American Chris Weidman to get the job done via second round arm triangle choke submission against Bruno Silva. Now we move to the co-main event of the evening in the welterweight division between Vicente, the silent assassin Luque, taking on former middleweight, now turned welterweight in Joaquin Numansa Buckley. Honestly, guys, I think this fight is very difficult to predict. Uh, we do know that with Vicente Luque, he came back, got that win over Rafael Dos Anjos, was able to reverse positions against the cage, was able to get takedowns of his own, and kind of out-grapple the fighter who we believe to be the much better grappler in Rafael Dos Anjos and win that fight via decision. Um, Joaquin Buckley is going to be at a grappling disadvantage, but he does have decent wrestling. He can shoot takedowns. 
He can shoot blast double legs. We saw him use that against, uh, in, not in Mavov. Uh, his last fight, he used his wrestling a little bit more against Alex Morono. Um, and he got, he has like that Mike Tyson bob and weave style. You know, slip, slip, roll, come back on the counters, right hook, straight left hand, double the left hand, move to orthodox, throw the right cross from, from orthodox now. Uh, left head kicks like we saw him drop Andre Fialyu with. I think Buckley is very live in this matchup to knock out Vicente Luque. Luque has been clipped. He's been cracked and usually finds a way to come back. But after that Jeff Neal fight, after that brain bleed that he had, you got to really think about it. Like, is Buckley going to have too much power? Being a former middleweight too, I think that's something that people might gloss over. Um, I think he's more built for the welterweight division, but he's going to have a lot of pop on his shots. The only thing I don't like is his defense. He doesn't have the best defense. He kind of runs in a little bit wild. He kind of darts into his punches, darts into his combinations, and kind of springs forward. And he's been clipped on the way in before. He got clipped off that kick catch against uh, Chris Curtis and knocked out. That was against the Southpaw. But Luque's counter left hook, counter straight right hand. I think the counter left hook is going to be there for Luque on the blitzes of Joaquin Buckley. Um, and I think... Luke might be live for a submission here. Let's just say that Buckley does want to use his wrestling. He might get takedowns, but he might get reversed into positions and, you know, lose in the scrambles and give up his neck to get caught in a darce. You know, Luke can lock up a darce from anywhere. He's gotten multiple darce chokes in his career, and he, he usually gets them in scrambles or after he hurts the opponent on the feet. I think he might catch Buckley coming in, clip him with a left hook, drop him. Buckley tries to panic wrestle, gets his neck caught, and gets submitted. Um, I do think Buckley is live to hurt Luke. Um, Luke doesn't have the best defense. He kind of relies just on a high guard. There's no real slipping. There's no real rolling. Um, he kind of just stands there. And against a fighter who moves as much as Buckley, that could definitely be an issue with you with Buckley just being too fast and coming coming in and cracking him over and over again. Might be an issue with the offensive wrestling of Buckley going up against Luke, who has better takedown defense at this point in his career, but has been out wrestled and taken down multiple times in other fights as well. Um, but I think I like Luke. I feel like Luke, and maybe I'm a little biased because I, you know, I seem to always pick Luke, but I think Luke's counter left hook. He's got very good covers and counters. He'll cover and counter with that left hook, cover, counter, right hand, left hook. I think the counters as Buckley moves into range is going to be able to clip a guy like Buckley. And I think he's going to hurt him with a shot, force him to panic wrestle. And I think he's going to lock up that neck in the front headlock and get that Darce Choke submission. I think Buckley gets submitted here. I think people are over relying on the offensive wrestling because we saw Buckley with the blast doubles against Alex Morono. But I think it's not the wrestling of Luke that's going to be the problem. It's going to be the offensive jiu-jitsu and the way he can counter that wrestling with his jiu-jitsu. But it's mainly just from the front headlock. He doesn't have submissions off of his back with like arm bars and triangles and things like that. But I think he clips Buckley coming in and due to that forward momentum, he falls forward getting countered with that left hook. And then he tries to panic wrestle and shoot or stand up too fast. And I think Luke grabs that neck and locks up the Darce choke. I'm going Vicente Luque to get the job done here via a second round Darce choke submission. I think he clips him with that left hook. Even though he has had trouble against Southpaws, I think Buckley can definitely clip Luque and hurt him here. I do think Buckley is live here. I don't think that he's, you know, completely outmatched. But I think just the counter ability is going to be too much for Buckley. I think he comes in, gets countered with a big left hook on the way in. Gets his neck caught up in a darce choke on the way up or after he gets dropped and gets submitted. So give me the silent assassin, Vicente Luque, to get the job done against Joaquin Numansa Buckley via second round club and sub darce choke submission. All right, and now we are at the main event of the evening in the women's flyweight division between Aaron Cold-Blooded Blanchfield and Manon the Beast Firo. This is a great fight. This definitely deserves to be the main event, just like Hibas and Nami Yunus last weekend. And honestly, I think that this matchup is going to play out one of two ways. Either Blanchfield is not going to be able to get a hold of Firo and keep top position, and she's going to get picked apart from the outside, or Blanchfield's going to take a little bit of a beating in the first couple rounds, but then start to pick up the pace, start to get in the face of Firo, push her back, Cause her to keep backing up and circling, moving laterally left and right. 
and eventually just trapping her up against the cage, getting to the over-unders, getting to the double-unders, kneeing to the body, kneeing to the legs, getting those inside or outside trips, and working from the top position. I think that Firo is very difficult to take down. I think if you go and look at her overall takedown stats, let's see. She has a 64% takedown defense with uh, Blanchfield having a 36% accuracy, but she shoots about 2.86 takedowns, or she gets 2.86 takedowns per a 15 minute fight on a 36% accuracy rate. And that means that she shoots about eight or nine takedowns, and that's only in a 15 minute fight. We're now looking at a 25 minute fight. 64% takedown defense for Firo. On the feet, it's 4.71 strikes landed per minute for Firo to 5.58 for Blanchfield with a 52% significant strike rate on both sides. That means that Blanchfield lands about one more strike per minute and keeps about the same accuracy. So she has just a little bit higher of an output than Firo and they take about the same amount of strikes. Even though on the stats it says Blanchfield has a 62% defense, I don't really know where they get that from. But looking at this fight stylistically, I think on the feet, it is going to be a Manon Firo, you know, showcase. She's a southpaw fighter. She fights on the outside. Going up against the orthodox fighter in Blanchfield, she's going to use that jab. She's going to use the check right hook to circle out on the outside of the lead foot of Blanchfield. Line up the left body kick. Line up the left head kick. Line up the left inside low kick. Uh, she's going to want to be careful with the body kicks because you don't want Blanchfield to catch it and then just push forward and get into those clinch positions where she can work for takedowns. You don't want Blanchfield to catch the kick and then sweep out the other leg and then wind up in the top position. I think anytime that Blanchfield gets on the top position against Firo, She's going to be winning the fight, I think, whenever Firo is able to stay on the feet and keep it on the outside range, that's when Firo is going to be winning. But Blanchfield has the striking to back up the grappling. It's just, I feel like this is the most dangerous striker that she's fought in terms of technicality and overall power. You know, Firo has a lot of power in that straight left hand. Uh, decent kicks, you know, check right hook is pretty powerful. She even likes to step in with the straight left and then follow up with the right hook after. She'll kind of step in, boom, and then come off with that hook to kind of circle out. Instead of going hook to the cross, she'll go cross and then kind of shoot that hook in over the top. She'll go ha ha, and then, you know, circle out. Front leg side kick, front leg side kick to the body. I think front leg kicks are good if you're at the uh, specific range against Blanchfield. But if you throw it from too close of range and you're not able to fully extend it, you're going to give Blanchfield a pathway to get to your back and get to the body lock and work those trips and work from the top position. I think that if this was a 15-minute fight, I would probably favor Manon to win uh, a decision. I, I don't think she'd finish Blanchfield. I think Blanchfield is tough. But the fact that it's a 25-minute fight, I think Blanchfield eventually gets the better of her, eventually closes that distance, eventually slows her down, lands the one-twos on the feet. She has good striking, too. Don't think that Blanchfield is just a, a, a grappler. She has good low kicks. She uses a really solid one-two. It's very clean. Uh, she uses her punches to get into range. She can hold fighters up against the cage. Was able to control and hold Tyla Santos, who's one of the strongest fighters in that division, now she's over in the PFL. If she's able to hold and control Tyla Santos up against the cage, there's no way she's not going to be able to hold and control a fighter like Manon Firo up against the fence. Um, I think Blanchfield takes over late. I think she takes over in the third and the fourth and the fifth if we get to the fifth round. I think the forward pressure, the clinch, the cage control, um, the ability to land strikes and not be afraid in, to get into striking exchanges and then have the grappling to fall back on on any mistakes that Firo makes, makes Aaron Blanchfield the clear side in this fight, in my opinion. I think Blanchfield's going to close that distance, get those takedowns, push Firo up against the cage, eventually just slow her down, break her down, and get her on the mat to the point where she's not going to be able to use explosive energy and get back up. Early, she will get back up, but I fear that in her ability to get back up, she'll give the back to Blanchfield, just like Andrade did. The minute she gave up her back, boom, took the back and got the rear naked choke. I think Manon's going to be in a similar situation, but it's not going to happen super early. It's more going to happen late during the fight, and I think Blanchfield is going to be using that forward pressure to slow down and kind of cook. Firo, she'll lose the first couple rounds, I think. I think Firo will probably outstrike and outpoint Blanchfield early in the first and second round, and then the third, fourth, and the fifth, I think, is when Manon Firo 
is going to be able to really pick up the pace. So I think Aaron Blanchfield, or I'm sorry, not Fioro is going to be able to pick up the pace. That's where Blanchfield's going to be able to kind of drown Fioro, and Fioro's going to slow down and be more giving of those top positions once she gets those takedowns. So I like Blanchfield via a third round rear naked choke submission. Uh, I could see a ground and pound TKO, but I do think she gets Firo out of there. I think she eventually slows her down, uses that cage pushing and everything that we just talked about to break Firo. And, and she's very strong. She's very technical. If it stays a full striking match, I think Blanchfield can be competitive, but I don't think she wins it. But I think Blanchfield knows that. She's a smart fighter. Very young in MMA, but has very high fight IQ. And uh, she's not going to quit on herself. She's going to keep pushing forward, even against a fighter in Tyla Santos, who I believe hits much harder than Firo. She's going to keep pushing forward and keep moving. And I think eventually she gets those takedowns, gets that cage control, uh, gets to the top position off those inside or outside trips, works her way to the back, and gets a rear naked choke submission. I'm going Aaron, cold-blooded Blanchfield, to get the the job done and defeat Manon Firo via third round rear naked choke submission. All right, that's it for my UFC Atlantic City picks. You're watching this on YouTube. You can subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, smash the notification bell for anything related to mixed martial arts and pro wrestling content created by the Touch em Up podcast. You can subscribe to my Patreon, <clears throat> which I just relaunched in the uh, description of this video for $10 a month. I'll give out free betting picks for every UFC card, betting tips, and post my betting slips for each card. And yeah, let's enjoy UFC Atlantic City, Blanchfield versus Firo, and let's make some money this weekend, guys. Have a good night.